Please be seated. I invite all of our children. Uh oh, some of them are taking a side trip. Come on, kids. I'm not going to bite you. Hey, Grace. How's the foot? Better? Foot's better? Yeah, good. What'd we do? Lose Logan and William? Come on, guys. Good morning. Are you awake yet? <laughs> All right, which one of you adults is going to come up here and sit down with us? There you go. I'm glad there's somebody who can still get up. Good morning, children. Thank you. I like it when you say good morning, Father Rick. Good morning, children. How you doing? Come on, Emily. You'll find a seat somewhere. Y'all scoot over and let Emily sit down right between y'all, please. Somebody. There you go. There you go, Emily. How you doing? That doesn't sound good to me. How you doing? There you go, there you go. That's what I like to hear. Okay, Father Rick's been teaching you all some stuff about church, right? How to make the sign of the cross, how to fall, bow, all this stuff about altar and what have you. I want to talk a little bit today about prayer because I just learned something that I want to pass on to you. Okay? First of all, do you all say your prayers? <coughs> do you all say your prayers? Ah, that's what I thought you did. <laughs> when do you say your prayers? At dinner? When? At supper? When else? When else do you say your prayers? At night? Here? That's yeah, good. Very good. We say prayers here all of the time. What do you do when you pray? Uh huh, that's what I thought. You thank God for the world, so you speak to God, right? Good. Now then, do you sometimes kneel down like this at home when you're saying your prayers? I used to kneel beside my bed every night when I was a little boy. Now I lay me down to sleep. Do you all say that prayer? Now I lay me down to sleep? Well, something I just learned, as a matter of fact, you all might find this interesting too, some, that I just learned from a priest friend of mine who's a Franciscan priest, and he talks about that when we pray to God, it's not just about words, but it's about using everything we are, our heart, our mind, our bodies, our bodies. So he just gave me a prayer that helps me to use my body. I want to teach it to you. Is that okay? Good. Stand up. All right. It's got four parts to it. It's pretty easy. All right. Here. Where are you going? I'm not done yet. Jeez. Okay. First part is like here. Everybody do this with me. This is a sign that you're ready to receive something from God. The second part is like this. That's we're reaching to God to be hugged by God and to hug God. And then the third thing is to go here to your heart, which says, I take into my heart, God, the love that you're giving me. And then finally, we reach out to the world to love the world the way God has loved us. Pretty cool, huh? Let's do it together one more time. Right here, God, help me to receive your gifts. God, I hug you. Hug me. God, thank you for loving me. God, help me to reach out and love others. So you can do that every day. The first thing when you get up, you can just do this, 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 and this. Come on, let me give you a stamp. This might take a while, folks, so get, be comfortable. 
One or two? You don't care? Okay, well, there you go. I got you two. How you doing, William? Good. Oh, what a beautiful <clears throat> ring. Where did you get that? Are you getting married? No? <laughs> oh, you got a beautiful ring, too. Are you getting married? No? You sure? Okay. Just one? Okay. Hey, little bit. You want two? All right, let me have that hand. What? Because I want you to remember that no matter where you walk, I forgot to say that. Jesus, where are you going? You think you're too big to have? Huh? Hey, what are you doing out of line? Hey. One for you. Let's get this one right here. Up here so you won't put it in your mouth. <laughs> here you go, William. One or two? Two. Okay. Uh uh. -huh. There you go. Okay. Just one? You sure? Okay. How do you like that prayer form? It's pretty cool, huh? Yeah. Come, Lord Jesus. How I love you. How you feel me. How I love all those to whom I'm deeply connected like a sun salutation. Try that. Try that in the morning when you get up. So, um, and some of my Sunday school class, well, not sun, almost all of my Sunday school classes of recent, we've been talking an awful lot about the new and changing demographics of the, um, of the religious world, of the spiritual world. And some things I've already shared with you, but they bear repeating. Uh, a couple of things that we've learned that was very, that are very important, and and frankly, they're so important. If the church does not take and pay attention to these issues, um, it's going to go down the drain. We won't have a church like we know it in 50 years if we don't pay attention to these demographics. One of the things I was having a conversation, by the way, with Father Steve this last uh, Tuesday. And I said to him, and I truly believe this, I'm not, uh, I'm not scratching you behind the ear when I tell you this, this parish is on the verge of something great. And I can't tell you why. And maybe one of the reasons I think this parish is on the verge of something great is because you guys get it, that there is a change, there's a seismic change that is going on in the church. You get it and you're not afraid of it. You're willing to embrace it. So the largest growing religious identity in this country in terms of uh, statistics, of course, is none, N-O-N-E. You've heard me say that before. Also, the church of the 21st century is comp compared to the church that I grew up in. The church that I grew up in, people would identify as religious but not spiritual. Today, people identify more as being spiritual, but not religious. Now, what does that mean? When we talk about being religious, it usually, not usually, it is about an identity with an organization, with an institution. When we talk about being spiritual, it's about concern to connect with the mystery of the holy. So today's world, as I've said, identifies itself more as spiritual than religious. Now another thing that we learned is there are several very good reasons why the nuns and those who identify as spiritual but not religious are not a part of the church, of the traditional church. 
One of those reasons, one of those very powerful reasons, is hypocrisy. These folks are nothing but a bunch of hypocrites, and I don't want to associate with them. These folks are do as I say, not as I do people. Gandhi himself said not many years ago, if the Christians and the rest of the world had listened to Jesus when he gave us the commandment to love one another, there would be no need for wars and there would be no need for armies. Do as I say, not as I do. So, as Father Steve told you um, from the pulpit, our announcements, what have you, last week I was up in Cleveland at my granddaughter's baptism. This is an example of hypocrisy to me. And I know he told you something about that, but uh, I'll rehearse it with you from my, from my perspective, my point of view. My granddaughter is a, a multi-ethnic child. Her father is Filipino, and her mother is white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. Beautiful baby, absolutely gorgeous child. Of course, I wouldn't have any bias about that. <laughs> But when, when something happens in the Filipino culture, if, if someone is baptized or married or, or, or dies, what have you, it just, it's not an event that occurs just within that family. It's an event that occurs within that entire culture. In celebration of my granddaughter Addie's uh, uh, baptism, uh, they roasted a pig. Part of their culture, they roasted a pig. So before the baptism, Kimberly, my daughter, went to the, um, the deacon of the cathedral. They go, she converted to Catholicism, and they go to the cathedral of, of St. John the Evangelist in downtown Cleveland. And um, they don't happen to have a priest right now. I mean, they just have priests coming in and out because the bishop is, well, we won't go there. But anyway, <laughs> somebody knows what I'm talking about laughing over here. But anyway. So she had to talk with the deacon, and she asked the deacon, Deacon, my dad is an Episcopal priest, and I really would like for him to come and participate in this baptism. Eh. Ain't going to happen. So she calls me on the telephone, and she says, Dad, they won't let you participate, and I am so angry about it. Wear your collar. That's my kid, man. <laughs> That's my kid. So I said, yeah, really? Ask Michael about that. So she asked Michael, her husband, yeah, 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 have him wear his collar. So the first thing is, is that we're there and there's a mass. And uh, first of all, the baptism did not occur within the context of the mass. Here you've got the central act of admission into the household and the body of Christ occurring outside of the meeting of the body of Christ. Does that make any sense at all? No. Okay. So we're sitting there on the front row, and, you know, I've got my fine collar on. You can't miss me. And the priest, well, first of all, during communion, I says, I'm going to go up and, and receive a blessing. Tell my daughter. I'm going to go up and receive a blessing from the priest. And I wanted to do that as an act of honoring the priesthood of the person who was there. I know it's pretty nice, right? So I guess, Kim, I'm going to go up and get a blessing. Oh, no. Oh, don't do that. Mm -mm, no. He wouldn't know what to do. Okay. Mass is over. Priest comes out, greets people, walks like I'm sitting here or right here, walks by. I mean, not kiss my foot, go away. I can't stand you. Hello, my name is Nada. Well, I'm not going to let that pass. <laughs> Hi, my name's Rick. I say to him, what have you. So then we got down to the baptism, which was lovely. And, you know, I've worked with enough uh, uh, Catholic deacons and priests to know 
that don't push them within that very rigorous structure they have to operate in. So he allowed me to do some anointing and to place my hands on that baby's head and to um, welcome her into the household of God. My point is this, and I would tell it to Pope Francis. Jesus said, a new commandment I've got for you, love one another. Don't support the Catholic Church or the Episcopal Church. Love one another for God's sake. Sorry, you can't receive communion here, nor can you participate in a baptism. Do as I say, not as I do. So today we've got Jesus, um, first of all, in confrontation with a bunch of Pharisees. Gosh, that sounds familiar. <laughs> with a bunch of Pharisees. And, you know, the whole issue is around purification laws. Now, in the Jewish faith of Jesus' time, whether one stood in right relationship with God was dependent upon whether they were pure or not. And to be pure, you had to ascribe to and perform 635 laws. I couldn't keep up with 10, 635 laws, dietary laws, when you're supposed to wash your hand, when you were supposed to immerse yourself in a pool outside of your door, da 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 So Jesus is saying to the religious scholars of his time, he says, look guys, you've got it all wrong. It's not what goes in your mouth that defiles you. I mean, really think about it for just a few minutes. What happens when something goes in your mouth? It goes into your stomach, it comes out as waste, and it goes down into the sewer. How can that defile you? But it's what comes out of your mouth that defiles you. You know that old saying, once the word leaves your lips? You can't bring it back. <coughs> How many times have we said, God, I wish I hadn't said that? Right? But you can't get it back. It's not what goes in the mouth that defiles you. It's what comes out of the mouth. Yay, Jesus. One for Jesus. But then he leaves and says, well, okay, I'm gonna, let's go up north a little bit to Sidon and Tyre. This was Gentile country. This was the land of the Canaanites. Now, where did we meet the Canaanites before? Didn't somebody conquer them? Who conquered them? The Israelites. So there was none too happy an arrangement between the Canaanites and the Israelites. Kind of like Palestine and Israel today. Matter of fact, it's almost the same territory. Hmm. So Jesus goes there. This is unfriendly territory. Um, what would I compare that with? <laughs> Being from New York City and walking into the Green Top Cafe in Walker County, it's kind of like that. <laughs> so as they're walking along, this woman, this Canaanite woman, starts screaming at Jesus and screaming at the disciples, Jesus, Lord, Son of David, I need some help from you. I've got a daughter that is tormented by a spirit. Well, if you're walking in hostile territory and somebody starts yelling at you, what's your natural reaction to that? Uh-oh, somebody's coming after me. And what did Jesus do? Not a word. The woman is persistent. 
the disciples are really getting upset because maybe there's going to be a crowd gathering on her and they're going to be in deep trouble because they're the only Israelites that are there in the middle of that Gentile Canaanite country. So they come to Jesus, shut her up, Jesus, please shut her up. Jesus doesn't say a thing. The Canaanite woman comes up to him again. I mean, falls at his knees. <clears throat> You're not going to ignore me. Jesus, son of David, my daughter's suffering. Do something about that. Jesus says, I have come to save the lost of the house of Israel. I have come to save the lost of the house of Israel. Not Canaanites, not Gentiles, house of Israel. And it wouldn't be fair to give the children's food to a dog. Now, in the Greek, <laughs> and probably in Aramaic, the word that is used there for dog is a female dog. You know what I'm saying? Jesus was calling that woman a female dog. And not to be deterred, that woman looked up at him and he says, she says, yes, but Lord, even the dogs get the crumbs under their master's table. If that's not a two by four beside the head, I don't know what it is. Can you imagine the look on Jesus' face? What did you just say? I've never seen faith like this. Your daughter's healed. Wow. Jesus gets his comeuppance. Um, I, I had to ask this question. Why in the world would Matthew juxtapose these two stories in his gospel? On the one hand, Jesus said, nothing that goes in your mouth is going to defile you. It's only what comes out of your mouth that's going to defile you. Then the very next story is him going somewhere and something coming out of his mouth that defiles him. Jesus is presented in a matter that is not too flattering. What's more, he's presented in a hypocritical matter. Jesus suddenly becomes one who is saying, do what I say, not what I do. Why would Matthew do that? Here's how I worked it out. Uh, do y'all, anybody here know Bill Style, Bishop Style? Anybody know him? You know him, Foster? Okay. Bill Style was the eighth bishop or ninth bishop? You remember Foster? Something around there. Something around there. Uh, he's, the, he, he's the one who ordained me. Something he said a few months before his death in a sermon that he preached at St. Thomas Church, where I was at the time in Birmingham, and, and, it, and it went something like this. There's just something about this Jesus that I can't get away from. There's just something about this Jesus that I can't get away from. I cannot recall a time in my 70 plus years that this Jesus of Nazareth hasn't been in my life. Now, I'll be the first to admit that it's been an on-again, off-again relationship. <laughs> but somehow, we've hung in there with each other. Through good times, through bad times, through mediocre times. What I've finally come to understand 
is that I've never really had a problem with Jesus himself. What's troubled me is the supposed orthodox language about Jesus. The ossified, dried, cold, dead language of creed, doctrine, and dogma. You can't baptize this baby. As though this language could be the final word about the man from Nazareth. The same Jesus that just would not let go of Bill Stow and me. My relationship is not a relationship with a theological concept. My relationship is with a person like me, a being like me, a soul child like me. My relationship is with an itinerant Jewish preacher who was intensely human. My relationship is with a prophet so much in touch with something eternal and transcendent that in him I get a glimpse of what I call God. My relationship is with a Jesus who can screw up and still be called holy. That's my Jesus. That's who I hang with. That's who I try to follow. That's my main man. Amen.